Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Dennis, glad to be uh, back at the Orchard with you again, and I'm real excited about being a, a part of this Heroes of the Faith series. It's really important for us to look back through the scriptures at women and men who, through their ups and downs in life, uh, walked with the Lord, and we can use them as examples in our lives, because in reality, every time we look at one of these different lives, we recognize that God is in the business of changing people, always has been and always will be. And he works in our lives mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually to bring us to the place that he wants us to be in order to serve him and glorify him more. So uh, I'm just really honored to be uh, with you this morning because we're going to look at, uh, at a, a life of a woman who goes from being a, a prostitute to one of a very godly woman who influences many other people for the Lord. So how did the change take place? Well, let's take a look at it together. Open your Bible, please. Joshua chapter 2, as we're continuing our series, looking at the life of a woman by the name of Rahab, who finds hope, even though she's in a very hopeless situation, who finds hope for a transformed life. Uh, Joshua chapter 2. Uh, I think it'll be important for you to have a Bible in front of you. There's one in the pew rack there. Uh, the book of Joshua is towards the front, and uh, I think it's really, really good that you have the scriptures, because we believe that the scriptures are living and active, and they speak to our hearts and our minds when we're open to it, and they reveal thoughts and intentions that God wants us to deal with. So reading the scriptures and having them in front of us, really, really important to do. Joshua chapter 2. Here's the context for what we're going to be uh, reading. Uh, according to chapter 1, Moses has, has died. He's the great leader of the Hebrew people who brought them out of slavery in Egypt. Well, he has passed away, and his hand-picked successor was this general Joshua, who was charged then with leading the Hebrew people into the land dispossessing the people and to take control of the area that God had promised to them. And the reason why Joshua chapter 2 is in our Bible and the conquering of the city of Jericho is to reaffirm that when God makes a promise, he keeps it. Because if you remember, you read your Bible, the land we know as Israel today, it belongs to to God, that's very clear in the scripture, and God promised it to Abraham, Abraham and his descendants, and Abraham is the father of the Hebrew people as well as Arab people, but he in particular gave the land to the Hebrew people, that's why we call it the promised land. Well, in the book of, of Joshua, chapter 2, we're going to see him begin to fulfill that promise as General Joshua leads the army then across the Jordan River. There's between 1 to 2 million Hebrews who have come out of Egypt. So it's a massive group of folks that we're going to be reading about here in this text. In chapter 1, with the command given to go take the land... We come into chapter 2 and we see that General Joshua, he's a very competent military leader, and he realizes he's got to check out the land here, and that's what he does. Let's pick up our text, Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1. Then Joshua the son of Nun sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. Now, I put a bad map up here, and I, I don't, can you even see that? A little bit, I'm sorry, I should have made it bigger, and I, I did, didn't do a very good job on that. Historically, Moses has led the people out of Egypt, so they come out of Egypt through the Sinai Peninsula that we know today, and come right up just to the west side of the Dead Sea, down in the south. Uh, they uh, mess things up. They don't go in and take, out the, take the land at that time. 
And so God sends them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, after 40 years, all those disobedient people had died. And so Moses led the people up just to the right side of the Dead Sea to a town called Shittim. Again, just think, they're seven miles to the east side of the Jordan River. Jericho is another seven miles to the west of the Jordan River. So they're about 15 miles apart. What's 15 miles from here? Is Vista about 15 miles? It's about that. So just imagine there's one to two million people in Vista wanting to come to the Orchard Church. That's the historic situation at this time. So with, with that in mind, Joshua decides, I'm going to send in two spies. Previously, Moses sent in 12 spies, and it did not work out well. So Joshua learned from Moses' mistake. He says, I'm sending two guys in, and I'm not even telling the people that they're going in. So they, they get sent in in secret, and, and they're going to go in and do a reconnaissance. Uh, where's the water? How equipped is the enemy? Are they ready to fight? What's their leadership like? He, he wants to know, because they're about to go into battle. So these two men, most likely, left Shittim, probably went north, and swam across the Jordan River. That is, this time would have been very deep and very wide. Swam across the Jordan River to come down and try and come into Jericho from the west. So there's a military reason for everything that Joshua is going to do. The, the issue becomes God has a little different perspective on what they're going to find when they get to Jericho because there's a very, very unlikely accomplice waiting for him. Let's pick up our text now, verse 1. So they went and came into the house of a harlot whose name was, what? Rahab, and lodged there. She becomes the central figure in this whole conquering of Jericho. Now, what do we know about her? Well, Right off the bat, most people are familiar who know their Bible, is that she's a prostitute. Uh, the word in the New American Standard is translated as harlot. Um, scholars debate that translation. Some think it should be uh, translated as innkeeper. But everybody agrees, however you translate it, harlot or innkeeper, she was probably a prostitute. Because that's the way that, that, that many women were forced to make their living. And so this, this house of prostitution, the men go to. Why would they go there? For, uh, for sexual reasons? Maybe. The text doesn't say anything about it. But anyway, they, they, they go there. Would it have been a place where they could be kind of uh, inconspicuous that foreign men would go to a house of prostitution? Maybe. Would they be able to talk with other men and find out about the land and what was known? Maybe. We're, ju we're just not told as to why they end up there other than the fact that this is all God working out his plan here for this conquering of Jericho. So they're on this secret mission, and they go to this house of prostitution. Uh, the challenge is it's not very secret. Verse 2, it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Uh, the king of Jericho, I, I think more like a mayor of Jericho. And uh, he's just a, a ruler of the city area there. My guess is that he's got the whole city on high alert for terrorists. Because there's one to two million 
uh, people in an army in Vista that's coming this way. So I'm sure he told everybody, be on the lookout for these folks. So once he finds out that they're at Rahab's place, he sends military police to uh, capture them. Verse 3, king of Jericho sent word to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. Now, uh, important for you to know that in ancient times, military police didn't go busting into people's homes. There's no, you know, frag grenades or, you know, bombs or anything. They were ramming doors down. They didn't do it, especially not women's homes. And so they say, bring, bring the spies out. And uh, I, I read an interesting account. There's an ancient code of Hammurabi. It was a legal code around 1750 BC that kind of was followed by everybody in the ancient day. And it simply said that if a harlot or the wife of, a, of an innkeeper harbored any kind of terrorist or felon and didn't report it to the king, she would die. So Rahab's got a decision to make. Military police come, bring those guys out. So what's she going to do? Well, she's going to lie through her teeth. That's what Rahab probably is best known for. Verse 4. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. Line number one. She obviously knew where they were from because she hid them. Clearly. Line number two, verse five. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out. They left, which is a lie because we're going to find out they're upstairs. Line number three, I do not know where the men went. Line number four, pursue them quickly for you will overtake them. Well, the posse is never going to catch up to them because they haven't even left the city. So verse 6 explains what Rahab did. But she had brought them up on the roof, hidden them under the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the, on the roof. A flax is just a reed, long reed, three to four foot sections, kind of like a skinny bale of, uh, uh, of hay. And she just put the guys down and just put them on top of them. So she hid the guys there. So the posse listens to Rahab's lies they take off. Wild goose chase. Verse 7. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan, to the fords, and as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. So the posse takes off, and they're heading due east to go back towards the Jordan River. Well, the guys are upstairs. Now, the critical question when we study this whole uh, hero of the faith, uh, Rahab, um, was it morally right for her to, to lie? What do you think? Morally right? Come on, give me a thumbs up. What do you think? Morally right? Come on, you got to commit. <laughs> morally right? Okay. Morally wrong? Man, that was... Uh, undecided, huh? <laughs> All right. Uh, um, espionage, times of war, deception, lies are all a part of it. War is coming. People are going to lie. Is it okay to lie? All you parents out there, are you going to teach your kids it's okay to lie? Or is this one of those, uh, you know, do as I say and not as I do kind of, you know, <laughs> parenting principle? Well, I, uh, I'll just give you my perception on it. Because we get caught in a lot of these moral choices, don't we? 
when are things right and when are things wrong. I, I think on this one, we got chapter and verse on this one. I mean, one of the Ten Commandments is that thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't lie. And if you notice Exodus chapter 20, there's no asterisk after that verse that says applicable only in certain circumstances. So let's just, I, my opinion, you'll have to think this through. Lying is wrong, morally wrong, but I would lie every single time to protect my family. Somebody comes in, I've hidden my, my wife and kids, they say, where are your kids? I say, oh, they're in Detroit. <laughs> I mean, this is what the Dutch folks did in hiding the Jews from the Nazis. You know, morally wrong, but we're going to do it every single time. But here's the point that I would make with you. The whole reason Rahab's story is in our Bibles is not to teach us when it's okay to lie. That is not the point. The author's whole point in this is to teach us about her faith. That's the whole point. That's what we're to copy. That's what we're to emulate. That's why she's a hero to us. Because notice what she says, verse 8. She goes up and talks to the guys. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord, that Yahweh, has given you the land. Now, how did she know that? We're just not told. Did a gentleman come into her place of business and tell her about the Hebrew people? and about the Hebrew God? We just don't know. All we are told here is about her spiritual convictions. That's the point the author wants to drive home to you and me and us about Rahab. She is absolutely convinced that Yahweh, the God of the Hebrew people, first, would deliver the land. God had made a promise to Abraham, and he was going to carry it through and give this land that she's living in, the land of her people, the land of her history, the land of her ancestors, he's going to deliver that land to the Hebrew people because Yahweh is a faithful God. And when he makes a promise, he carries it through. When you think of Rahab, think about her faith. And then she goes on to reveal that the Canaanites living in Jericho were scared to death. Verse 9, that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all of the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. I'm sure it was a great encouragement, but now why were the people so terrified? Because Rahab's convinced Yahweh is mighty in power. Verse 10, For we have heard how the Lord, Yahweh, dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. So we heard the stories from 40 years ago. Moses leads the Hebrew people, goes to Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh says, go on, get out of here, has second thoughts, sends the army after the one to two million people. Moses gets to the Red Sea, goes, oh, we're in trouble, puts the staff, the waters separate, they cross on dry land, the Egyptian army comes running into the water, and what does Moses do? Takes the staff, water comes in, the Egyptian army drowns. Rahab says, we heard about that. And you know what? I'm convinced you don't mess with Yahweh, the God of the Hebrew people. Do not mess with him. Verse 10. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Again, she go, she's going back 40 years. So they come out, they destroyed the Egyptian army, God did. 
they come around, they come up to go to the promised land. Moses leading the people. They've got to go through the territory of the Amorites. And it's the quickest distance to get from point A to point B. They've got to go right through their territory. And so they ask permission of the Amorite king. Sihon says, can we go through? We won't drink your water. We won't eat your food. We won't steal your animal. We won't hurt your people. Just let us go from point A to point B. And Sihon says, nope. And instead attacks the Hebrew people. And God gives the Hebrew people a great victory over Sihon, completely destroys them. They take all their property, they take all their animals, they take everything. And then they keep going. And the king up in the north, in Bashan, the area, a guy by the name of Og, does the same thing. He attacks, and they conquer him. And Rahab says, you know, we heard about that. And you know what we learned? God keeps his word, and you do not mess with him. Mighty in power. Verse 11, when we heard it, our hearts melted, no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. So, this is why we're studying Rahab. Not to learn about how to lie but to learn about the importance of faith, that God keeps his word, that God is powerful, that Yahweh is the one true God. See your statement, verse 11? For the Lord, Yahweh, your God, he is God. The Canaanites, they had their own pagan gods. They had Baal, Asherah, Marduk, Ishtar, all pagan demonic deities. And she says, um, I'm convinced that Yahweh, your God, he's the one true God, not these other pagan folks. See, she makes a decision. Now, Ruth is going to have to make this decision too with her mother-in-law Naomi. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God, that's what Rahab has done. I'm not siding with my ancestors, with my family, my history. I'm convinced that Yahweh is not only faithful, powerful, the one true God. He's in control of everything. Verse 11, for the Lord Yahweh, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. What's she saying? She's saying the world as we know it, it hasn't come about by chance, not by luck, not by karma, not by some evolving principle. But there's a God who's in charge of it all. And she says, I believe it's Yahweh. And I'm, I'm casting my lot with him. I'm going to follow him. See? And so, you know, this is not a woman out to save her neck because she thinks Jericho is going to get conquered. This is a woman who's declaring her faith and her trust. As for me and my house, we're going to serve Yahweh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You make that decision. I would venture to guess that most of you have, or else you wouldn't be here. But what Rahab, as a hero of the faith, is to be remembered for is these, the step of faith that she took. And that's the way the New Testament remembers her. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not with those who were disobedient after she welcomed the spies in peace. She did it by faith. See? She, she was in a place where she had to make up her mind and then take a step. Okay. I believe that Yahweh, faithful, powerful, 
alone as God is sovereign. I am convinced of that and therefore I'm going to say yes to these spies. Come on in here and I'm going to protect you. That's what she's remembered for. And James does the same thing to speak about her faith. James 2.25, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the message and sent the, when she received the messengers and sent those out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. What's he saying? Her faith was genuine. She really was convinced that Yahweh was faithful, powerful, uh, alone was God and sovereign. She really believed that and James says it showed when she took that step of faith and said, come on in here and I'll protect you. So, what's your step of faith? Wish I had the chance to sit down with each of you. What is it that the Lord is saying to you about what you believe and how you show that? You know, and so many of you are taking steps of faith. I just want to tell you, keep going. But if you've drifted away and your profession of faith has just kind of been up in your head alone, but you know in your heart you've got some stuff going on either you're, that you're doing or not doing, that's why we're here this morning. That's why Rahab is a hero to us, a model to us of what true believers do. See, we, we, make the, we make the Christian walk sometimes too hard. We, we read the book, and then we take a step of faith to put it into practice. That's it. So... She takes the step, welcomes the spies, and then she makes a deal. Verse 12. Uh, now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's household, and give me a pledge of truth, a sure sign, and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, and my sisters with all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. So the men said to her, our life for yours if you do not tell this business of ours and it shall come about that when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Deal. Agreed. Verse 15. Then she led him down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall so that she was living on the wall. She said to them, go to the hill country so that the pursuers will not happen upon you. Hide yourselves there for three days until the pursuers return. Then afterwards, you may go your way. So uh, she sends the posse out of Jericho east towards the Jordan River. She sends the two spies west up into the mountains that surround Jericho. And there are all kinds of caves. I've been up in that area. You could hide there forever. Nobody would ever find you. She says, go west, stay up there three days, and then after they've come back, then you can head east and go to the Jordan and go back to Shittim and to your, your army. Verse 17. One final arrangement. The men said to her, we shall be free from this oath to you which you have made us swear unless when we come into the land you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down. So she's going to put some kind of a red rope out of the window that she let the guys down with. Here. 
and gather to yourself into the house your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. It shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be free. But anyone who is with you in the house, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be free from the oath which you have made us swear. So she says, deal. Verse 21, according to your words, so be it. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window and they departed, came to the hill country, being there for three days until the pursuers returned. Now the pursuers had sought them all along the road but had not found them. And so they head back. They get back to camp and report in. Verse 23, the two men returned, came down from the hill country, crossed over, came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they related to him all that had happened to them. They debriefed. Verse 24, they said to Joshua, surely Yahweh has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before us. God is going to give us this great victory over Jericho. Let's get the army ready to go. So there's chapter 2. And it's really interesting to me. Um, how does God give Jericho into the hands of the Hebrew army? Do they attack the front gate? Do they storm it? They shoot arrows into it? What does he tell them to do? Walk around the outside of the buildings, the walls of the city, seven times. And then I'm going to tell you to blow a trumpet. And I promise you, all the walls will come tumbling down without you having to touch them. What is he telling them? I'm faithful. I'm powerful. I alone am God. I'm sovereign. And what I'm going to ask you to do is take a step of faith. And trust me. It's, all, it's always about that. Okay, let me wrap up here. How, how can you and I and we apply this? August 25, 2024. First lesson. God knows all about you. Knows everything about you, just like he knew about Rahab here. Think about her background. She's a Gentile. She's outside of the covenant promise of God. God has not made a, a covenant with any Gentile nation, only with the Hebrews. I'm uh, Irish and Italian. No covenant with my people. No covenant with the Canaanites. And God knows. She's a woman. She's on the lowest rung of the social ladder. Uh, God knows that she's a pagan. She grew up in a household worshiping uh, demonic deities. Her chosen profession was, come on, she's, pros she's a prostitute. Many women forced. And she's a liar. And yet, God knew her, and God still loved her, and wanted her to be a part of his family. So, what's your background like? Some of you have had the great blessing of being raised in a Christian home. Great gift from God. But I would tell you this, God knows all about your shame and your guilt because you're not perfect. Because you feel like you have to be perfect all the time. He knows all about that. And he still loves you. If you're raised in an average home or if you're raised in an abusive home, he knows all of that. And he still loves you. Still wants you. Part of his family. So, 
If you, you, you think everybody's oblivious, man, may, they, they may, may be. God's not. You know, when I sit down and when I rise up, no, no mystery to God. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path, my lying down, are intimately acquainted with all my, my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Yahweh, you know it all. You will not be alone any time today or any time this week. And it won't be a mystery what you go through. He knows. And he still loves you and still wants you to be a part of his family. Secondly, lesson for us. God's got the power to, to change you, to grow you, to develop you, have you keep going. That's what he does with Rahab. Gives her the gift of faith. And that gift changes her life. Same with you and me. If you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, say amen. Uh, you're a brand new creation. All things have passed away. Old things. New things have come. You're brand new. And now what he tells you to do, it's the same thing. You've got to take a step of faith. You've got to read the book. Take a step of faith. So you students, um, I'll tell you, don't cheat on your exams. Just don't do it. You know, you've got a choice to make. Guys, you've got to be serving it in your home. We've got chapter and verse on that one. Don't lie. Whatever you're watching on your computer, uh, be careful. Uh, you, we just, we're called to take these steps of faith here. Get involved in a ministry. You'll go, go out here and you'll see all the ministry areas. Some of you have been, just been waiting. Rahab's in here to, to say, take that step. Get connected. That's what he wants us to do here. In Rahab's case, interestingly, she gets rescued. She goes and lives on the outside of the Hebrew camp and then ultimately makes her way in. And she meets a man. And they fall in love and get married. His name was Salmon. And Salmon becomes the father of Boaz, of Ruth and Boaz. And Boaz and Ruth have a little baby called Obed. And Obed has a little baby named Jesse. And Jesse has a little baby by the name of King David. And King David ultimately has a son by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So we have a prostitute in Jesus' family tree. And she goes from being a harlot to the Hall of Fame. So can you. So can you. What do you have to do? You have to take some steps of faith. And I don't know what it is. Is your heart open to it? Of even asking, what's, what's my next step? Hope you will. You might need some help. I encourage you to contact the church. Elders here, you might need to talk to a therapist or a spiritual director or a counselor or a trusted person. If, if God can change Rahab, he can change me. Thirdly, God can equip you for ministry to others. It was interesting um, in my preparation to note that in the Hebrews 11.31 passage, the, the two men who are sent secretly are called spies in Hebrews 
James, though, when he talks about Rahab, he doesn't call the two men spies. He says, was not Rahab the harlot all just, also justified by works when she received the, what? The messengers. Huh. They thought they were going as spies. God sent them as messengers. To whom? Most likely to Rahab. Is it possible that the two men filled her in? That God loves Gentiles? That God loves women? That God loves people with pagan backgrounds? That God loves prostitutes? That God loves liars? Did they fill in those pieces? And God knows you. God has the power to change you. And God wants you a part of his family. You may be just a student, but understand this. God's got a far greater plan. You're a messenger of his. You may describe yourself as a homemaker. Great calling. You're also a messenger. You're a lawyer. You might be a retired woman or a retired man. You're also messengers everywhere we go. And that might be the step of faith that we take, where we reach out to other people. Train and equip to share. So... The message from the Lord to you and me and us is don't be afraid to take that step of faith. Whatever it is. But you've got to stop and think for just a few minutes with your mind and your heart. What is it, Lord, that you're saying to me? And anybody for the first time? Jesus saved me from my sin. I don't know if you've made that decision yet. But you have to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. That he died on the cross to pay your penalty in full. You can't pay any of it. He paid it all. To prove it, they buried him after he died, and he rose from the dead. He's alive August 25th, 2024, and he's ready and willing and wants to forgive you and come into your heart and change your life. Anybody for the first time, I'm so sorry for what I've done, Lord, my sin. But I believe, I believe in you, your death, burial, and resurrection. I want you as my Savior. Come into my heart. Forgive me. I want to follow you. Anybody this morning? That step of faith. You think that through, won't you? And you make your decision. All right, let's pray. Oh, our Father in heaven, please speak to your people. And encourage, Lord, my sister, my brothers, my own heart, to take those steps of faith as needed. We thank you for your love. We commit ourselves to following you. So here we are, Lord. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.